Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and good morning and good afternoon. This is uh, In Conservation With, and I'm with the lovely Emma Mitchell, and I'm David Lindo, also known as the uh, Urban Birder, and In Conservation With is sponsored by Leica Sports Optics and King's Place Music Foundation, and this is part of their Nature Unwrapped season, which is actually ending quite soon, end of the year for them. So that's the, uh, the sort of formalities out of the way. And the next thing to say is good evening to, to Emma. Whereabouts are you in, in Britain at the moment? Um, I'm in East Anglia, about 12 miles from Cambridge, um, in a very tiny rural village. So full Fenland, really. Um, and I would say that sitting here now, I'm only a couple of miles from a short here dowel or two. So it's, um, it's pretty cool. Um, um, and as the crow flies, about two or three miles from Wiccan Fen. Oh, I know Wiccan Fen, actually. I've been there a few times. It's good. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Short hair dowels are always great to see as well. Oh, amazing. I've only ever seen one, um, but I'm hoping to change that this season. So they, 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 they came back, I think, in November. Is that right? Is that about right? Maybe, yeah. The winter, the winter in some areas, like in where you are in eastern, eastern England. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those who don't know Emma or know about Emma, she has a very well followed, popular Twitter account and also quite well, very well followed Instagram account too. Um, she's an artist, designer, you design jewellery and you're a writer. Is that in the right order, by the way, do you think? Um, yeah, you can swap them around. I mean, um... I think if it was, I was wanting to sound fancy, <laughs> I'd say author um, and the designer maker part of it used to be at the top, but it's, it's shifted around. They're very much linked though, um, because both creativity and um, what I write about um, connect, you know, when I write about connecting with nature, both of them are, as, are equally as important. I mean, literally right now, I'm, <laughs> you can't see it, but I'm surrounded by um the things i'm shooting for my next book and it's it's hardcore craft so um yeah there's a lot of twigs <laughs> i'm quite glad you can't see it actually but yeah um i do both the, both science and um making and creativity are, are both equally important for me. yeah can you actually explain a bit more about your background i mean your sure. art design side for example where did that come from and how it, long? i'm self-taught so i've got haven't got a single exam in that um but it's i've done it i've made things drawn and created things from bits i found in the garden since i was tiny um and so that was something that i never thought would be play any part of my career or earning ability um and it the fact that it now does is is a brilliant surprise but my background um, in terms of education is um, science so I trained I went pretty far down the science make, uh, scientist route and um, so yeah my degree was in zoology but specifically um, when it came to um, sort of cellular stuff so I know quite a lot about DNA and the dog is now singing her song again I apologize <laughs> to let her in otherwise there'll be this little soprano throughout our conversation i, I, I will be just a, just a few seconds hold on i can't hear a single thing actually to be honest oh, but, really uh, what well, you can't hear the dog i can't really uh, leave her outside though <laughs> and my husband's upstairs i won't be a sec honestly it'll be very very quick so just uh, a message for you zoomers if you've got any questions along <laughs> The way you just feel free to ask them and we can talk about them during the course of the first hour and then um when there's you know the next bit the, the q a i'm sure there'll be a load more questions but I'll do for that no problem but emma i mean okay the science but what with the art stuff i mean how did that kind of come about when did you realize that you could draw paint and you, you can make this really interesting jewelry that you do oh um well, as I say, it's just been part of my life and part of my brain since I was extremely small. Um, the jewellery side of it, um, when I was doing a PhD in London in the late, mid to late 90s, um, I mean, any job can be really stressful, can't it? But that was 
at times pretty tricky and because I was in a place where there were amazing bead shops and stuff and I would I had been passionate about making jewelry since I was very very small I used to go and sometimes skive off my experiments and go and look in the bead shops of London in Covent Garden and just sort of gaze at them and um, I taught myself how to make the sort of fashionable jewellery of the time um, and it was a source of um, what I realise now I used to do it to wind down and that's exactly what I've been doing ever since so, th so that's what's that 20 20 between 22 and 25 years I've been doing that but I, I made it I made jewellery as a child as well um, and that continued um, and when after I had children there was a really difficult uh, sort of family a traumatic event in my family um, when my second child was born literally weeks afterwards and that's the point where I just started a craft blog and I had I started documenting they weren't really related at all the blog that became a source of real solace and it became um, an online community that really helped me through and I find online communities are incredibly important for me um, but it documented my progress with this magical stuff that I use to um, I teach it it's called silver clay and um, what's brilliant about it is that you can cast things you find in nature to incredible levels of detail which you can't do nearly so much if if at all with um, like a sheet of silver um, so it's 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 fantastic stuff. What I should have done really was got a couple of examples, but all the things I've made for my Etsy shop have just been shipped to America. So um, I don't really have many examples to show you. But yeah, um, so 2008 was um, the beginning of my craft blog and that was my beginning of starting to write as well. So I would document sort of small family happenings. What and a, a lot of what I wrote about was the wildflowers and the sort of seasons that were, I was starting to observe because we moved here in about 2003 and I grew up in um, suburban Liverpool and I'd lived in cities ever since. So moving here was a chance for me to really be become a naturalist very slowly, but surely. Um, and I, yeah, I, my, my blog became quite popular. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because I talk nonsense and um, I was quite open about difficult things. And I started to find the winters really difficult, really, really tough, because that's when this traumatic event had happened. It was sort of the beginning of um, September. And so that winter in 2008 was in, incredibly hard. Um, and I, used, I started to associate winter with immense levels of stress but I also I also suffer from SAD so it was a double whammy and so on my blog I started to um, encourage people to share how they got through difficult times or and particularly through the winter and that eventually became my first book Making Winter which is um, there isn't very much science in it because I hadn't started to um, really read about the research that links nature and mental health and also creativity and mental health yet. I was aware of it. I was, I was aware of the anecdotal evidence and the, and the lit literary references to both. Um, but now my bibliography is quite, quite huge. It's growing like every week um, because I came from an academic background. I now have returned to it after a gap of, I don't know, I think about 15 years or more. Um, and so now if I am doing something or I come across something um, on Twitter as some kind of inclin it, it, some kind of intimation that something is making somebody feel better. So what, I, be it creative or something linked with nature or um, anything really, I'm really interested in anything that we can do in terms of simple activities to shift what's going on in here because um, I'm not sure how, how many people here know, but I have, um, yeah, I have long-term uh, depression. And so 
it's a, a way to self-medicate, you know, um, creativity and contact with nature, obviously. That's why I wrote my second book about, but there are lots of other things you can do that shifts the balance of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're talking tonight about nature and the brain biochemistry, mm. but um, you, you, you had a couple of traumatic family events, as you said, yeah. and was that the start of your severe depression or did you kind of, how were your, how was your brain prior to that? Was it like that traumatic event that suddenly triggered it, you crossed the line and you became very depressed? Um, no, I have, um, I realized now had depression since I was a young adult and that I think I think I may have had a propensity. I think there's a genetic factor here. I think quite a few people in my family struggle in one way or another or did struggle. My granddad did, for example. Um, so I do think there's a genetic factor. God knows what it is. I've no idea. Um, but something happened when I was at college uh, in my second year. Um, and that, I think, was a trigger for mental illness for the rest of my life it was it was severely difficult and I don't really want to talk about it because some people who were involved in it were are still alive but um that was something that I have been struggling to sort of come to terms with since I was 20 so that's just 28 years it's a long time um and so living I, 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 for a while I thought oh um it's okay I'll just take do this treatment or I will take a little break and I'll be better and every time that happened and I got into a bit of a cycle in the 90s of this every time it happened I, I was better for a little bit and then it came back so um, eventually I realized I was living with a, a long-term condition really anxiety and depression together um, so I'm a bit obsessed with things that are effective in alleviating them and obviously the NHS is I can't I can't praise them enough though and we all know they're an incredible um, it's it's just an incredible thing that we have um, we're so lucky but even though I have had and this year particularly I've had amazing treatment um, there are days that come along where stress levels increase or difficult things happen and things shift um, and the pandemic, I think, has increased the likelihood of that happening for everybody. Um, it's, it's been immensely tough, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you describe, I've read somewhere, you describe depression as a grey slug. <laughs> That's and, been quoted a lot, yeah. Yeah, and I, I can actually, I can identify with that personally because, um, I am mean, I told you previously, but I didn't think, you know, I grew up in London, I you know, I was watching wildlife since I was a kid and all that sort of stuff. And I was hanging out with people and going clubbing and stuff. And I never really considered myself susceptible to depression. And yeah. I suppose when you're growing up in that age, you know, you just thought that people who got depressed, come on, snap out of it. What's wrong with you? You know, that sort of thing. But then I didn't realize that as a young adult, I suppose, I kind of fell into a depression. Did you? Uh, but for years. How, how old were you, David, at that point? I must have been about maybe, when I say young adult, maybe late 20s, 30, maybe even. Okay. And it lasted years. And I didn't oh, realize, really? I didn't realize until um, it got to the point when I um, injured my arm playing football and um, I went to the uh, physio who said, go see a surgeon. So I saw the surgeon and he said to me, you know, if you uh, have the operation, which I'll do it for you within three months, you'd be back to normal again. So mm. I took the operation, three months later, I was far from normal. I couldn't even get my arm slightly beyond my back, let alone anything else. And I felt as if I was a failure, you know, I felt a lot of things. And I think there were lots of external pressures on me, which I didn't actually appreciate. And it got to the point when I felt as if there was this grayness around me the whole time. And my brain kind of, it kind of felt foggy and, and heavy. And I felt very, very sad and weepy. Oh, that's I remember so going to see my, my physio and she said, I was standing in the corner practically, you know, she said, what's the matter? And I felt like crying. I said, I don't know. And she told me to go and see a psychologist, which I went to see that day. Yeah. But when I walked in, I got this sort of, 
aversion to psychologists, to be honest. I don't feel very comfortable in their, in their company in terms of them asking me questions. I'm thinking, well, who are you to ask me anything because you're not perfect kind of thing. That's, that was my mentality, which was basically that whole thing was added to when I went to see him because he was looking down at the table and he was writing something in the book or something and he said, okay, what's, what's your problem then? He didn't even look at me. So I just walked straight out and I went to see a doctor again the same day and he said, you've got mild depression. And he said, um, I can prescribe some tablets. And I said, I'm not taking any pills. And then he told me, well, in that case, you get out there and whatever you love, just do more of it. So I went back, got my binoculars and went out birding, which is quite interesting because as people in, into nature, we knew for years the, the healing benefit of nature. And it's, mm. I'm really happy personally that it's become something that people now kind of are registered, registering and realizing, oh yeah, that is something, that, that is a thing, you know. And what I like about what you do, Emma, because I've been looking at it for, for, for quite a while actually, is that you put out these nice videos on, on, in, on um, Twitter. You had one out, I think yesterday, where it's just very tranquil. And I remember the last one you put out, you're just looking at some um, vegetation and and you can hear a song thrush in the background. And just watching it for, for 90 seconds or however, however long it was, I found very calming. But you said in your text that um, looking at the vegetation allows your fractals to recover from stress and bird song brings your cortisol down. Can you explain what fractals and, and the cortisol thing is? And, yeah. and also, yeah, just ex talk us through how that, that works. Okay, all right. So. Because um, I suppose I had a scientific grounding in it, well, my education was focused really around science. I've got a brain that likes to um, find out how things work, sort of understand the nuts and bolts, such as they are, such, such as humans understand them, and therefore try to. And when it, when it comes to um, my depression and anxiety can I alter it? Can I improve it? And of course, um, in the eighties, in the 1980s, early eighties, I think, um, the Japanese, um, practice of Shinrin Yoku began, which is this forest bathing thing. And when it first came into the, um, Western press, it sounded a bit strange, you know, forest bathing. What, what do you, do you go out with a, hit bath and sit in with your rubber duck or what but in fact it's just getting um going out among trees and allowing the i suppose the ambience but also that this sort of um elements of nature to soothe you and to take in as much detail as you can um and that um was noticed by the japanese back in the 80s as i say um and it then became something that was almost prescribed or certainly advised by the government um, if people were both physically or mentally unwell. So that's been going on for a while. So nearly 40 years, I think it began in 1981 or two. Um, and as a result of that, the Japanese started to question why that was. Why were people feeling better when they were walking through a wood or forest? And in fact, now I think there's up to between 40 and 60 um, government approved forest trails um, that are for this thing called Shonrin Yoku and, and the, the direct um, translation is forest bathing. Now the Japanese started to um, try to like probe it and find out what nuts and bolts were, you know, what was going on and what essentially a huge raft of research boiled down to a few findings um, is that when we go out among trees and plants um, there are several things that are happening um, and one is that we inhale uh, chemicals that they produce called phytoncides they are reproduced as part of their own defense mechanism against the pathogenic agents that plants can get so they can get their own viruses bacteria and fungi and um, a lot of these phytoncides it's a group term for these for these chemicals are oils sort of volatile oils that you um might recognize if you if you um sniff them sort of individually um as green smells um similar to when you mow the lawn right 
you get you know you get that gorgeous mown lawn smell or the smell of lavender the smell of cedar so piney smells um but you get a kind of cocktail from each plant species and they are i suppose a form of um crude immune system but there's no kind of active cells going on it's just viruses don't and bacteria and fungi don't like hanging around in a place where these oils and chemicals are these phyton sites but when humans inhale them there's a series of physiological responses that are quite dramatic and quite rapid as well so the first thing um this doesn't happen in a particular order but i'm just going to name what happens so um our pulse rate decreases and that can be within a few minutes but certainly observed after 10 to 15 minutes so um, and it also our uh, blood pressure does as well. So you can imagine that's already starting to affect our circulatory system, which is quite a big, complicated set of pipes in, in essence. And that is having a, it, they decrease quite dramatically. So all we have to do is, and this can be repeated by the way. So if you take a single element of cedar oil, I think it's a terpene of some kind, or you can take a um, thymol, which is or thymol i don't know i don't know how you pronounce it it's the a main uh, one of the main phytoncides in thyme you know or rosemary and you put that as a single chemical in a tube or um something that people can sniff in the in a laboratory um you can repeat that with that single chemical and their blood pressure and their pulse rate will decrease and that's only at the start of it so another thing that happens um, is that your stress hormone levels go down. And this is the cortisol that you mentioned a minute ago. So when we have a fight or flight response, say you've got a flood in your bathroom, you're going to feel that slight panic and you'll be slightly frozen maybe for a few seconds before you think, oh my God, I've got to bail my, <laughs> bail my bathroom out. That le that's feeling of, oh, good grief, what's going to happen? You know, how am I going to solve this? Um, which you may also have in a work environment, you know, if you've got deadlines or if you've got a boss who's a bit of a git, whatever. That kind of feeling of stress um, is elicited by several responses, um, sorry, several chemicals, um, endocrine, uh, sorry, hormones that go around our uh, blood system. But one of the main ones is cortisol. And that is re released um, when we have a fight or flight response. And that is what another thing that is decreased when we inhale phytoncides. So cortisol is, it's really important in this whole area of research because it's, when it increases, it's a sign that we're stressed. So I would say that there were um, many, many tons more cortisol sloshing around the world right now compared to this time last year. You know, everyone's blood system, blood, bloodstream is being flooded with much more cortisol than pre-pandemic um, but when we when you inhale lavender oil or when you go out into your garden and therefore inhale sort of all the phytoncides that are being produced by the plants you've got out there or into a wood or onto a piece of waste ground wherever it doesn't really matter what kind of green space it is um, your cortisol will drop because you will be inhaling this brilliant cocktail produced by the plants um, for their own benefit, but it has a huge benefit for humans. Do you have to be kind of open to this? Because, um, you know, there's things like, for example, me and yoga don't mix. I know it's a great question. No, you don't. You don't I did yoga during lockdown. And the only reason why I did it was because I knew I wasn't exercising. So I need, needed to stretch, but I absolutely hated every minute of it. Did you do uh, yoga with Adrienne on YouTube? No, I did it. I had a, a, a personal teacher. You're fancy. <laughs> wow. So he, what, he or she came around or did it via Zoom? By, by Zoom. And it felt like a chore for me. Oh, was, yeah. Was, no, no, you don't have to sort of tune your brain in. Like, it doesn't, it's not a sort of... Um, series of brain waves that you have to trigger you know you know how if some people say that they can be hypnotized very easily and some people don't it's not like that it is a, um, a human response it's basically in our it's hardwired in our pathways because 
it's a mental reward that we get in fact for going outside into a green space because that's where our ancestors would have found everything everything they needed that was the that was their high street and so when we went out there our bodies responded with a relaxation response in a way also a decreased stress stress response because we were more likely to find what we needed to survive out there be it medicinal plants obviously some form of meat um vegetables to eat but also all the building materials we needed so that's where we would find among trees and plants is where we would need to go in order to survive so that's why our bodies are hardwired to respond quite dramatically and positively to being in nature do you think that this whole issue of anxiety and stress and depression has that always been with us uh, as a human species or is it more about our way of life now in terms of being very sort of you know urbanized um it's a great question and i think those 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 pathways that come from the sympathetic nervous system it's that part of our nervous system that generates the fight or flight response it's incredibly important because if there, were, there was danger that we would now see as a, a sort of unlikely situation that you'd only see perhaps in a horror movie um and literally it would be a predator um you know maybe three up to three maybe 20 up to, between three and twenty thousand years ago if there was seriously like a predator that could come and eat your child then that response allows allowed you to think quickly uh metabolize you sort of get your sugars ready so that you could actually literally pick up your child and leg it away from the saber tooth something whatever it was so it's incredibly important but now it's much more likely that we get that response because we've got some kind of passive aggressive stuff going on in the workplace or we've got somebody who a loved one who's dying or you know maybe a pet you know i mean that's as important as a loved one um or we have a pandemic literally a viral predator knocking at our door it's the same response and it's an important one but now because in modern times we can't really do anything we can't we can't necessarily get away from our social media feeds that are literally feeding us the fact that we've now got a new mutation of covid and it's in the south east of england there's no there's no you have to still go to at school um school if you're under 18 you you have to still go to the supermarket um but there's a virus out there that could be life threatening and and we've got information about it coming constantly so there's no there's no sort of break and so that cortisol response that fight or flight response is for for a lot of us it's almost constant and so things like things that can dial it down that science shows dials it down can have been i think crucial for people's mental health and, and survival in a way throughout the throughout 2020 so i think that's why people have liked my videos because you can only post i think it's just over two minutes of a video on twitter and i post the stuff that helps me um, and it's only in the last few years that I've realized it helps the viewer as well. In fact, there's a little bit of there's some research that shows that stills or moving images of nature are, are effective in bringing down cortisol as well. So you don't have to be out in it, out um, among trees and plants. It's not as, um, as hugely beneficial an effect, but it's still there. It's, it's lower level but you still get a, de a dialing down of cortisol if you just look at images. And that's important for people who have lo got long COVID or people um, in uh, care homes who perhaps have limited mobility and people who during lockdown, for whatever reason, maybe poor mental health, couldn't get, and I, I found it really difficult to get out the house because my mental health was, was really badly affected. Um, so, and I often just look in my camera, my, you know, my camera roll on my phone 
of small videos I've made in the past two or three years. Sometimes if I feel really rotten, I look at what, I mean, it might be a snake's head fritillary. It might be a baby grass snake that I saw in a nature reserve back in April, whatever. And then, then my brain says, well, okay, this might actually help somebody else. And so I'll post it. Oh, I'll edit it a bit, stick it on Twitter. And, um, it has helped others. And I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled by that. Yeah. I think your feed is very well known for those wonderful moments that you put up. And um, when we were talking um, before this, um, you were talking about the fact that when people see something that they deem as beautiful, mm. something happens to their brain. That's right. You yeah. Expand on that. Yeah. So it's something we haven't uh, talked about in this conversation yet. So uh, there's another, so this parasympathetic, sorry, the sympathetic um, neuro nervous system produces that fight or flight response, which I've mentioned. Um, and then there's a dopaminergic system that is responsible for us motivating humans to um, seek out what they need or what they enjoy. Um, and it's, I've been learning about the dopaminergic system a lot in the last two years. I'm, I'm fascinated by it because when things go awry, it leads to addiction. Um, but day to day, if you eat a meal of any kind, you will get a burst of dopamine in your brain because again, it's a mental reward. It makes sense to have a bowl of pasta because that's going to make sure of your survival. Literally, that's what our brain is saying, right? Pasta, good, like mental reward, little, almost like um, mental fireworks. It feels like a, a being elated. It is actually being elated. And so back 3,000, 20,000 years ago, a bowl of pasta would have had more significance for our survival because there's a whole lot less food around. We actually literally go and find it. So those pathways are still there. Um, but dopamine is also triggered to be released when we, well, yeah, when we look at something beautiful. So there's a piece of research that I, I'm not quite sure how many people it was testing, um, but they, the people were, um, were in a gallery, an art gallery. And I think, I can't quite remember how the experiment was designed, but I think people were asked to go and look at the painting that they thought was most beautiful or the sculpture whatever it was a piece of art um, or whether they were just allowed to wander around and look at art in general the, the whole of the gallery for I don't know 20 minutes or, or an hour or whatever and then their dopamine was tested and it was tested beforehand as well and dopamine levels increased significantly when people were looking at something that they deemed to be beautiful compared to like a um a uh, control where I think people were looking at, I don't know, some kind of um, random images or I don't know what it was. I don't quite know what the design was. But anyway, what it showed was when humans look at something beautiful, they get a burst of dopamine. Now, I am not entirely sure that this is true, but when I see a blue tit, I think that is as beautiful as anything I can see in the Fitzwilliam Museum down the road. Um, any kind of, I mean, not knocking the Fitzwilliam, I think they're equally beautiful. You can go and look at whatever beautiful pieces of um, Egyptian um, finds or paintings or whatever, but I get the same response. I feel the same when I see, and it doesn't even have to be a fancy bird. It can be literally a house sparrow. I get the same response. So I believe that we're getting the same when we see something that we deem to be lovely in nature. Now, again, why would that be? Um, and it could be li literally linked to sort of um, the possibility of a blue tick kebab for our ancestors. <laughs> so what, you know, why would it make any sense for us to have a mental reward when we saw particular plants or in particular uh, sort of birds, mammals or whatever? And it was probably to do with dinner. And obviously I'm not going to eat my blue tit, but what I can do is enjoy that elation that seems to come from looking at birds. And again, there's, there's strands of research that confirm that um, for urban dwellers. There's this beautiful piece of research by um, the University of Exeter and a couple of other um, academic centres as well that show that um, if you are able to observe birds in foliage through your window, in um in a city 
you know, wherever you live in the city, your mental health improves. So it's, it's so nice to bring bits of strands of research together and think, well, okay, when we look at something we, we deem to be really lovely, we get dopamine. Here's a, 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 several other strands of evidence that show when we look at a blue tip through the window, our cortisol go down, goes down or we feel more positive. We don't, we feel less low. It's, it's tantalizing and there's, there's more research to be done. Yeah. So it's, I suppose it's a veritable visual feast in many ways. Then you see something that kind of not, not feeding your stomach, but feeds your brain, feeds your imagination. And mm. Fran B in the audience has actually suggested that perhaps it means that there's food there for you too, i.e. the seeds. Perhaps that could be something as well. Yeah. But one thing you talked about when we had a preliminary chat was the concept of looking at branches or looking at the back of leaves and that really mm. struck a note of me because I know you can talk about it in a second but I remember yeah. once when I during my sort of blue period as it were I went to Berkeley Square and I sat it was during the winter or early winter and I sat on a bench and Berkeley Square for those who don't know is right in the center of London because surrounded by concrete and it's a small square with a few London planes and I looked up and I saw how the the branches and the twigs kind of form this kind of archery or kind of like a lung, it looked like, you know, all the different sort of veins or whatever. And I found it really peaceful. I kind of sat there and I, and I just felt at peace. Did you? That's so interesting. And it, what I'm fascinated by from what you just said is that you thought it looked like a lung and it, it's exactly like that. So the structure of many um, human physical parts of us are um, patterned um, as fractals. So they are, they are essentially fractal-like or actually create fractals. So a fractal, as I said in my um, segment on Autumn Watch, it's a structure, um, I should have got one with me, but... Mm, We've got a little bit of fractal action, fractal like action here. So this is a seed head, right? Of a kind of campion that grows in my garden. It's only a partial fractal, but essentially we've got, see this here. So we've got the main stem and then that divides there. Sorry, I didn't mean to make a rude sign. That divides there. Okay. And then this divides again there. Right. And then we've got further divisions. So the definition of a fractal is a structure in which um, a motif, so let's say it's, 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 a, it's a stem and then it dividing at the top. That's a motif that we can think about that is repeated on different scales. So you can see it gets smaller as you get further away. And that is the case, uh, sorry, it repeated on different scales in the same structure. So I've waffled that and fudged it slightly, but essentially um, that is, uh, fractals appear in nature in lots of different places, snail shells. So you've got that spiral, but of course, as you go towards the center of the snail, it gets smaller. So it's a repeat of that motif. Um, and the in, in terms of the distance between them or the, the shapes and the sizes, it, it follows this golden mean. Um, uh, and Mandelbrot, um, who's the guy who, uh, in the 70s, who um, sort of defined fractals and discovered them and realized that they were prevalent in nature. Um, he devised some very beautiful um, equations to just to, you know, to define and describe that. But yeah, when we look at, there's a lot of wintry trees around at the moment and you can see them against pretty dingy skies or sometimes they're very beautifully sort of watercolor blue skies. Um, when you look at a skeletal tree without its leaves against the sky that is a fractal and that's what you will have seen what what season was it david when you looked at those London early plains? winter just yeah. there was no leaves in the tree or the trees were quickly shedding their leaves anyway yeah um now there's a few strands of research again it's tantalizing not a great deal has been done but what's been shown is that when humans look in a laboratory setting at computer generated fractal patterns that echo the branches of a tree or echo also the you know the, the patterns of the veins on the back of a leaf 
when they look at those patterns, um, they recover from a stress, um, from stress, 60% more quickly. So what happens in a lab is there's a standard uh, thing people do in order to, uh, the, the scientists do to induce um, a cortisol fight or flight response in a human being. And it's usually getting your bare arm and sticking it into a bucket, massive bucket of very icy water that tends to trigger a cortisol and fight or flight response, right? And so what happened was they will have um, put their arm in after looking at those patterns and they would have measured the, the um, decrease in cortisol over time. Now, normally it would have it decreased at a certain level, a certain rate, sorry, there was a graph and it was decreasing much more quickly after, when they'd looked at those patterns, which is fascinating. I haven't described that very smoothly, but. You, you get the gist. Looking at this kind of thing, which you'll see everywhere in a green space, doesn't matter what it is. Back, yeah, the veins on the back of a leaf. So there's a, one of my little house plants here. So there's this kind of action going on. You can't see that very well, but the fractal like patterns that occur in nature, all it, you know, throughout nature, are having an effect on the human brain and inducing that relaxation response. Um, it's, it's, it's a small piece of research that, and again, it needs to be expanded, but it makes sense, doesn't it? Because again, if you, if you had been um, looking at that plane tree, you know, pre-civilization, so stone age, bronze age or whatever, there might have been a corvid in that tree that you could have made into dinner or something, you know, again, I, I do not, say that we need to make jack or pie by any means what well, I'm, I'm sort of describing why your brain would have responded positively and in a relaxed way to seeing that pattern is there what is the difference between anxiety and mental health oh and well right. mental health describes um um a, a huge range of of conditions but also it can describe you being well as well as as being um and you know having mental illness and anxiety is just a part of it so i suppose if you um looked at a map uh each county might be a different kind of mental illness that you could have and some of them overlap so some of them are blended but what only one would be anxiety and you may have other conditions um such as borderline personality disorder or you may have um uh, depression and of course depression and anxiety often come hand in hand um so if you have anxiety it is going to affect your mental health but there could be there are lots of other things that could also um occur in your brain or conditions that may may be in um you know may become manifest that will affect your mental health so mental health is a very broad term i suppose and anxiety is very common condition that will affect it adversely okay <clears throat> excuse me in in combating um depression for example yeah what is I mean, obviously, we, we're talking tonight about nature being a massive cure, and it worked for me, even though it took time. It didn't happen overnight. Mm. What is the best thing in terms of the combination? Do you think you can take drugs and also be in nature, or do you think you should shun drugs and just go and try and see if you can cure yourself by being in space and, you know, connecting with nature? I don't think you should rule out any treatment at all. I mean, um, what the NH parts of the NHS, um, in terms of sort of parts, uh, some GP um, surgeries, I can't remember the, the term for them now, but some GPs, uh, particularly up in Northern Scotland, prescribed a three-pronged approach. So normally if you, if you present with um, poor mental health in terms of maybe anxiety or depression or both, they will offer you, as, as, as happened to yourself, um, potentially antidepressants of some kind, the modern antidepressants, ser serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors. And 
they will also potentially put you on a waiting list for a talking cure of some kind. So maybe CBT or maybe counselling. But um, as an experiment a couple of years ago, um, and I'm not quite sure what the progress of this project, but they were also encouraging people to either walk on the beach or walk in a green space um, regularly. And that was because of all the research that I'm, well, I'm just, I've only described little parts of it, but this huge raft of research really um, demonstrating that nature shifts our brain biochemistry in the same, in a similar way to antidepressants. So combine them if you can, and it depends on the severity. I mean, it sounds as though yours improved without antidepressants. And also, like I was when I was a young adult, I was really keen not to go on them. I was terrified of antidepressants. Um, I've now been on them for a really long time. Um, and I'd probably be on them for the rest of my life because of this, I think, this genetic factor and other endocrine and possibly neurodivergent things that are going on in my brain. So um, I've, I've come to terms with that, but it is a really difficult sort of um, step. It's a difficult hurdle. That's the wrong term, I think, for it. It's, it's, a, it's a different mindset where you've accepted that you're going to take a medicine that is going to shift what's going on in here. And it, it, it's, there are a lot of barriers to it. I think there's a, partly it's stigma, stigmatized, um, but also I think it's, um, it's, it's frightening. I was really frightened at the age of 20 um, when my doctor, um, my college doctor was saying, you're really unwell. You need to take these um, pills. Uh, you just try them, and I, I refused. I had the prescription. I had the pills, and I just—I was ter terrified of them. Um, so, if you are feeling like that, try and get out into nature. But at the same time, try to be. My advice would be try to be accepting of of, of antidepressants as a concept, and as something that you can um, try because. They are. They can be immensely effective. Um, and I don't know how much you want me to tell you about it, but I'm. I was on one, and um, as a result of uh, basically that indirectly the pandemic, which destroyed a small business of mine. I'm now on two, and the second one, David. What's really interesting about the second one, and it was prescribed by a psychiatrist uh, back in July 2020. Um, was is that it increases dopamine levels which is exactly what you get when you eat a plate of chips or you um, look at something beautiful or and you also get it when um when you have sex and when you're doing something that you really enjoy or um yeah it's triggered by it's interestingly triggered by uh, social media as well and uh, we could talk all day about how social media is addictive but my this psychiatrist who um was i i was he i was allocated to her books because i was really really unwell and couldn't i could, just could get out of bed i didn't know i yeah i was really um something i'd built up for 10 years basically was erased by covid and i i just couldn't get my head around it um and i'd made this thing this workshop business to fit in with my dodgy mental health and to fit in with family difficulties that are ongoing so it was something that I'd sort of created from something I was able to do and then I, I realized I could teach it and I built it up really slowly and it, it I then ended up on sort of country file and um uh it, it was really it was doing very well um but then it was just wiped out because of course people couldn't come around to my house um and I had no idea how to solve it. My brain just sort of <laughs> shut down and um, it was, pr it was pretty severe. It was very, very bad. My um, depression during lockdown. And she gave me this pill and I thought, Oh God, do I really want to take two antidepressants? Again, I got that. I was sort of trying to deal with that hurdle of my men I had a mental barrier. I just didn't want to, I just thought, my God, that's awful. What am I going to be on these for the rest of my life? Um, surely I'm tinkering far too much with my brain chemistry. So I resisted for a bit. 
uh, and I was still I was still as unwell. And then when I started to take them. I just thought, you know what, I'm so unwell. I've got to give it a go. And within two or three weeks, I got out of bed, and I started making lists of things that I needed to do. And they were small and they were modest, but that's something that had, you know, I was obviously doing that before the pandemic. That was my normal life. But, um, and yeah, and then, and then I sort of made myself little goals of okay, well, I can earn money this other way. Something I hadn't done for four years, which was making jewellery to sell. And I was really nervous about it for various reasons. And I put some pictures of these few designs that I had made with seasonal flowers between January. Actually, no, there were some late snowdrops that, I, that I'd found in sort of February, March. So around the time of the pandemic sort of becoming... Uh, wide, widespread knowledge and I made these um, these molds of real flowers and I then created these um, pendants put them on Twitter and I said look I've got no income right now um, but what do you think of these and it's such a lovely community on there and I know Twitter's got a terrible reputation it can be a cesspit but if you um, you can sort of <sighs> tailor your feed to have nice folk in it kind people gardeners crafters printmakers whatever um scientists that's what my feed contains mostly and uh, people were really encouraging and said we love these um if you've made them we'll buy them because they're you know they're made of real forget me not seed heads or they've it was just a, it was only seven it's only just seven designs and one of them was a dragonfly wing which is actually a fractal. Um, so the, the wanes on the dragonfly wing are a flat fractal as well. And um, yeah, so then I opened my Etsy shop. It took me a while to pluck up the courage and get there. And also the mental energy was pretty scarce because I was recovering from what essentially was a breakdown. Uh, so yeah, it's a horrible word, but pretty accurate. Um, and I eventually got round to, not got round to, but eventually stocked my Etsy shop and did everything I needed to, to make it work and launched it. And people were just so supportive. And I think I realized I could, I could take on a certain number of orders over a certain number of weeks. And I fulfilled, I filled those orders in about 10 minutes. So I opened my shop, it went bonkers. And then I had to close it again because I, oh my God, I've got 25 orders. And I, um, so it was slightly terrifying, but also incredibly uplifting because it meant that people were, I don't, they weren't, I don't think they were pity buying. I think they liked what I was making. And um, it, it was a way to turn a corner and think, okay, my workshops may come back post vaccine, which may be another year from now. But, um, when we've all had it, I mean, but um, I can do this and it can keep the wolf from the door. So <laughs> it did. And um, again, it was nature because I was, I was using flowers. I was going to pick them in the garden or from the hedgerow. You know, I've got um, wild carrot and I've got, um, what, I've got a jay feathers that I make in silver. So it's a beautiful process. So I was getting small bursts of dopamine by just making them. So I've sort of created something that kept me vaguely financially afloat but that is benefiting my brain from just making these things because I'm looking at these gorgeous flowers and yeah it, it sort of worked <laughs> in a haphazard way. Thank you very much for your honesty Emma. Um, can I ask you what your favourite plant is? <laughs> yeah I don't think I've kept it a secret at all on Twitter it's cow parsley um, and that's because um, I realized a few years ago maybe four or five years ago that you can the seedlings of cow parsley start to be visible in the hedgerows and meadows around here or anywhere actually in parks across the UK in September or around there just when autumn's sort of knocking on the door and light levels are started, starting to decrease. And for up to 30% of 
British people, winter is daunting and they will have some form of sluggishness or lacking of energy. And, and about 7% of people actually have um, seasonal depression. So I'm one of those people, but these seedlings, you can watch them growing slowly over winter and they are the seedlings that will, event, will become the flowers, the cow party flowers for next, the following May. And I find that hopeful. It's almost like a little, I don't know, a little rope that you can pull along to get yourself from autumn through to March when you've got cherry plum blossom and things coming out and then the lights increasing and there's bird song and it's okay again, you know, in terms of you get lots of dopamine a day by just going for a walk. Whereas in winter it's tricky, but the, the cow parsley leaves are a fractal and they are a sign of spring in autumn. And, um, yeah, they're a thread to take you through the season. It allows you just sort of look ahead. And um, I liked it so I like it so much that I drew, I've drawn it in my book, um, The Wild Remedy, and I draw it a lot on cards and things or just doodles. And then I had, had it drawn on my arm as well. I don't know if you can see that. So that's actually my drawing, but turned into a tattoo. But it's upside down, but you can see it. Yes. Um, that's how... <laughs> It's my only tattoo, but that's how significant it is for me. It's a, it's a beacon of hope. Fabulous. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would you be right now? Okay. Um, I'd be in Tuscany, where I've, I've visited only twice, but it might, might be three times, actually, in my life. But, um, and the reason for that would be who pose? just hopping around as though, you know, as common as, well, not quite as common as jackdaws, but you can see hoopos without um, a news flash on a, you know, a birding website. They're just there and it, they're incredible. And, you know, when they do that thing, I'm sure you've seen many hoopos in your time, David, but that whole fascinator crest thing, the pink salmon, salmon pink sort of belly and the stripes and, um, also, the fact that they say poo three times and that's their call. That's, I, but they're, they're great. So that's one thing. Um, nightingales, pretty much everywhere. Um, again, instead of being this poor, rarefied little bird that just clinging on in the UK. They're just, yeah, I, I stayed in this little um, agriturismo place with my husband um, when we were first married. And there were about six or seven in this tiny valley, just tweeting away. So I was absolutely gobsmacked by it. I'm, I'm waffling too much, David, but um, it's because I get excited by the thought of it. Um, fireflies as well. Amazing. And these carpenter bees, the size of Cadbury's cream eggs, just flying around. These massive black, car huge, beautiful bees. They're, they're not aggressive. They look terrifying, but uh, amazing. And these sort of blue these they, their wings have a bit of a blue um they're shot with blue they're incredible it's the the, the whole wildlife oh and spot and swallowtails two kinds of swallowtails just flapping around like cabbage whites so yeah that and also i mean come on the ice cream and the pizza and the yeah all of it it's and murals you know a bit of renaissance painting on, in a little tiny church that you it's just yeah it's a good place. Oh, and the, the, the whole idea of wild, wild boar just snuffling around with their stripy babies. Very good. <laughs> All right, Zoomers, um, just to let you know that uh, tomorrow, in fact, not even tomorrow, Thursday night, we have Melissa Grew from the States talking about storytelling. She sees herself as a wildlife biographer and not a photographer, but she makes amazing images so we'll be talking to him Thursday uh, Monday on the 21st of December we'll be talking to national treasure Alison Stedman I had a good chat with her today actually she's a oh, great wow. and we'll be talking about nature and also plastics which is one of her massive um, things that she's been on about for, for many years now the fact that there's too much plastic in this world so we'll be chatting about that and then on Tuesday the 22nd which I think is the last maybe the last one this year, um, Dave Goulson, um, who's going to talk about 
bumblebees and other insects as he studies all that stuff. So we'll be talking with him about that. Um, it's been a really interesting, thought-provoking, um, deep, um, honest conversation tonight, Emma. Um, we haven't even met in the flesh yet, and I'm looking forward to that. We will. Um, but thank you very much for sparing your time tonight to be so frank with us. Um, and I'm hoping that the Zoomers um, enjoyed this and anyone else in the future watching this. So thank you very much. I'm really honoured that you asked me on to this, uh, David. It was a lovely surprise. Um, so I feel like I'm quite new to this whole world of nature writing and um, naturalists. So uh, yeah, it was a, a real honour to be to chat to you today. It's been fantastic. I hope you haven't heard too many grunts from my dog. It's the dog that made those noises, not me. But... <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for coming and thank you Zoomers. And don't forget everyone to look after yourselves in these troubled times and to uh, keep looking up.